I'm trying to prepare you guys to look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I really who I think and say that I am? The news came to Jesus. Please come fast. Lazarus is sick and without your help, he would not last. Mary and Martha watch their brother die. They waited for Jesus. He did not come, but they wondered why. The death watch was over. He'd been buried for days. And somebody said he'll soon on his way Martha ran to him and then she cried Lord if you'd been here you could have healed him he'd still be alive the door for days late in our hope hope say it again. The church is blessed with musical talent. From those who play instruments to those who sing solos or duets or trios or in a choir. This church is really, really blessed and I appreciate that, Miss Catherine. I always enjoy hearing you. You're a tough act to follow. I'll tell you that. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to chapter 14 of the book of Revelation will continue on. We'll finish that and hopefully finish 15 tonight also. And as you're turning your Bibles, I want to tell you a little story. I, I see things differently. I, uh, I always have. I, I, um, 
I struggle sometimes when others don't see what I see. When I was in seminary, I had a professor that it was in our preaching class, and I had to take several classes. I can't remember which one it was, but it was one of them. And he told the class, he taught the class that you, when you preach your sermons, you always have to have three illustrations and a, a, excuse me, three points and an illustration. And of course, me being me, I asked the question, why? Why does that have to be that way? And he was like, because it has to be that way. That's the way it's done. And I'm like, why? Well, because that's how we preachers do it. But why? Of course, he got a little irritated with me. I didn't mean to be irritating, but I was. And I, I just want to know why. Why does it have to be that way? If you can't explain to me why it has to be that way, then why should I, why should I have to do it that way? And I know a lot of preachers do just that. They will preach sermons with three points and at least one illustration, if not many illustrations. And that's fine. Uh, I don't typically do it that way. I think, I've always thought this, that the power is in the Word of God, not my outline, not the illustrations that I find. Um, and so I just felt like going verse by verse is the way to do it. It's good enough for Adrian Rogers. It's certainly good enough for me. Um, and so that's, that's really how I preach. I, I Doing so, you cover a lot. Often, you can cover a lot of territory in a short period of time, and that's on purpose. I'm trying to uh, get through the book of Revelation on a timeline here. We could go back and start all over again, and we could probably spend two years just taking our time going verse by verse again, but going a little deeper. But that's not the point to this series. Also, early in my career, I had preachers when I was a young pastor, and y'all, I didn't know anything about preaching, I didn't know anything about pastoring, I still don't. But I really didn't back then. But I had preachers come up to me, and they told me and others that were in the group, and I've had this conversation several times, that preach anything that you want to preach, but do not preach out of the book of Hebrews or the book of Revelation. And, of course, I do what? Why? Why? Tell me why. Well, they kind of hem hawed around and whatnot, and the best I could determine was that for the book of Hebrews... Uh, it's, it's coming from an unknown author. And I'm like, God, God wrote it. I, I don't care who the human he used. He doesn't have to be named. God wrote the book of Hebrews. I don't understand you guys. Why are y'all so scared of preaching the book of Hebrews? And then Revelation was, that, well, there's too many opinions. Uh, people nowadays have access to books and uh, tapes. At the time, it was cassette tapes. Y'all remember that, right? Uh, with different teachers, and they all have opinions. And I thought to myself, well, that's fine, because there's a lot in the book of Revelation that we don't know for sure. God just chose not to reveal exactly what he meant by it. So you can form your opinion based off of good exegetical uh, research, and that's fine. But if you make it simple, if you keep it simple, you probably won't get into any trouble. And I've had people, not here at this church, but other churches where I preach Revelation with the same process. I'm going to keep it simple. We're not going to get bogged down in the Antichrist. We're not going to get bogged down on 666. We're not going to get bogged down on who is the creature that comes out of the black lagoon and stealing the poor damsel in distress. We're not going to get bogged down in all that stuff. We're just going to say, we don't know, and certainly move on. It's worked for me. But I've had people come up to me, Richard, that it's like, well, I don't agree with that. That's fine. I'm not Tarzan and y'all cheetah. Or I, I, I don't, well, that's fine. Miss Megan, that's fine. <laughs> Miss Tina, it's okay. If you don't agree with me, that's, that's wonderful. People won't agree with David Jeremiah. People won't agree with Billy Joel. Or Billy Joel. <laughs> Billy Graham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I told y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm not as sharp as I used to be, I'm telling y'all. My mind doesn't operate the way it used to be. Anyway, I'm telling y'all that to, to get to this point. In order for us to understand the Bible, we need to keep it simple. You can, you can get yourself bogged down trying to study the Bible to determine one little phrase in that Bible. You can spend your lifetime trying to figure out what that little phrase meant. If God doesn't define it, it's not important for you to know. Are you all okay with that? He's telling us that that is in existence, but if he wanted us to know, he would tell us in the, uh, in the, in the Bible somewhere. So to understand the Bible, I wrote this down just a few minutes ago. It tags along with this morning's sermon. We need to understand that God wrote it. 
And because that God wrote it, it should be a little challenging to us. It should, listen, we're not reading Dr. Seuss. We're not reading Romper Room. The Bible should be challenging to us. But it's not impossible to understand. Number two, God wrote it for us, but he doesn't read it to us. It's not something that God's going to sit down at the nightstand when we go to bed and read us a bedtime story. That's not the purpose of this book. God wrote it for us, but doesn't read it to us. So that means we must read it. But we don't just read it, we study it. We don't just try to read it academically, trying to find all the pieces to the puzzle because you're not going to be able to do it. But if we try to study it as a love letter written to us, we'll spend time, won't we? We'll spend time trying to, to understand it better. Am I right? If it's just a, a junk mail that comes in the mail, you look at it, you might open it up and read it, and the first paragraph you throw it away. I don't understand it. I don't care about that. But if it's a love letter from somebody, you're going to pour over that thing. You're going to try to understand what they're saying in that written word. I've noticed that in school, the topics that I put forth an effort into were the topics that I mastered, were the topics that I eventually... might, might have been a slow going, Ms. Crystal, but sooner or later in that semester or that year, I would start to master that subject, but I'd have to put effort into it. The same way with the, the Bible. I start to see it more clearly as I study it. And like I said, guys, I see things differently. And that's okay. I don't make apologies for that. I'm just stating something that's obvious to me. I see things sometimes differently than others, and that's quite all right. So we're going to pick up in chapter 14 where we left off. I think that was in verse 13, picking up in verse 14. Is that what y'all have? Actually, we're in 13. I tricked y'all. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> yeah. So the scripture says this, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead. We, now, we just talked about the living. We just talked about the 144,000. We just talked about in uh, the first part of chapter 14, the assurance that God gives us that the redeemed of any age will be with Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of redemption. If you're redeemed in the 1400s, or if you're redeemed in the 800s, or if you're deemed, redeemed in the 2100s, it doesn't matter. If you're redeemed, you're going to spend your eternity with Jesus Christ. That's a hallelujah moment for the church. We should be thankful for that no matter what's going on in and around us. If we are redeemed, we will be in the presence of God at some point. And I'm looking forward to that. I trust you are too. Uh, verses 6 through 7, we see the gospel will, will be preached to the whole world. The end time... Listen... God is not changing the game plan one iota. It is the preaching of the Word of God that is foolishness to them that are perishing. But it is the preaching of the Word of God that has been given to those that will be saved. As much as I love the music, and God can work through music, amen? Here's the dichotomy of music and preaching. Here in this world, we get preachers get to preach, and we carry the burden of the preaching uh, um, delivery in order for people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can be delivered in song, but primarily it's delivered through preaching according to the Word of God. In heaven, I'm out of a job, y'all. I don't have anybody to preach to. They don't need preachers in heaven, but there's going to be a lot of singing. There's going to be a lot of praising, a lot of glorifying God through song. And I'm looking forward to that too. Amen. Verses uh, 8, we learned this morning that Babylon... Uh, will fall. This, this false religion will fall. It's going to fall, y'all. It may not fall in our lifetime. All this stuff that's going on now that's crazy, in my opinion, it's at some point going to come to an end, I think. We see in verse 9 through 12, the justice will be executed, the assurance that justice will be ex executed, and it will be executed by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it will be fair. It's not going to be a happy time, but it will be fair. We're going to pick up in verse 13, this fifth assurance in first, uh, chapter 14, that the dead will be at rest and rewarded. Verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So we're seeing the identity of uh, the, the people in verse 13 are the dead who are in the Lord, the believers who have passed away, certainly during the tribulation period, and the latter part of verse 13 is their reward. They receive rest from their earthly labors. They receive a heavenly work to do for Jesus Christ. Now, guys, listen to me. I have just read Scripture to you, and I've just told you what it meant. You can't get any simpler than that. And we're finding out, I think, that 
the book of Revelation, Ms. Carmen, as many people think it's mysterious and complex and hard, and it is to the person who's just going to jump in there, but for the person that's going to take their time and read it and think about it and study it and go, wait a minute, what's being said here? It's pretty simple. If we don't get bogged down in a lot of the analogies and a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the symbolism that's going there, Jeremy, it's not that hard. Verse 14 begins the assurance that the glorious harvest of the godly will take place. In verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Now white is, again, symbolic of purity. We know that by now. It's on this white cloud. And upon the cloud sat one like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. Now that uh, is symbolic of this royal rule, this uh, um, ability to, to judge in a manner that is appropriate and fair. And he also has his hand on a sharp sickle, and that refers to judgment. Judgment's coming. I do believe that where we get this notion that as we're saved, as we're, and when we die and go to heaven, we become angels, and we're on the cloud, and we're playing our harp and everything. I know that's Hollywood. I think they're getting that from here. That's not what it says. But I think this is what it has morphed into in the culture. Guys, listen, to, we will not be on a cloud. We're not going to be walking around on the cloud with our wings folded or flapping or whatever. We're not going to be angels. We're not going to be playing a harp. We're going to be around the throne of God for all eternity, praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. And he says, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the harvest of the earth, this angelic cry is happening, and the cry is for Jesus, this one that is sitting on this cloud, this pure, uh, uh, loyal, regal, just uh, judgment-giving God, Jesus, is being uh, encouraged to, to do what he's been sent to do. It's just that simple. Verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So the harvest takes place. So these believers, these tribulation saints, these tri tribulation people are going to be taken out of the world to be with the Lord forever. And so you'll notice that when John's writing, he's going from heaven to earth, heaven to earth, back in the past, into the future, heaven to earth, back in the past, into the future, the devil, God, Jesus, the devil. He, he, he's, he's, he's dancing around uh, the subject matter. That's not hard to understand either. We're given this assurance. And the seventh assurance is found in verses 17 to 20. And another angel came out of the temple. Again, God is using angelic proclamation now, as he did in the Old Testament and in the early part of the New Testament. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. Again, speaking of judgment, and cried with a loud cry to him that had a, the sharp sickle. Now, this, is a, this isn't Jesus. Now, this is the uh, earlier angel we talked about in verse 17. Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine and the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth. Now, the angel did it, not Jesus. This is a whole different uh, gathering here, a reaping here. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Believers do not have to be in any winepress of the wrath of God. The wrath of God has been placed upon Jesus Christ at the cross for your sins. The thing that gets God's wrath up is sin. You will never have to experience the wrath of God, this winepress, this wrath of God, if you are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Whether you are pre-tribulational saints or post-tribulational saints, you don't have to worry about it. So they're talking about people that have turned their backs on God, that have decided to follow the false prophet and the Antichrist. There is going to be this terror, this angelic cry of terror, and this angel has this power uh, to ha uh, have judgment over these people uh, that are ungodly, that have fallen for the, 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 the trickery of the Antichrist. Verse 20, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even into the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, this is going to be elaborated on a lot more uh, in coming chapters, but now we're talking about the Battle of Armageddon and the bloodshed that's going to spill. And this bloodshed is going to fill a valley that's 183 miles long, 
and about 20 miles wide to a depth of anywhere from two feet if the, if, if the horse is leaning down with his muzzle or maybe as high as four, four and a half, five feet of blood. Now, is this literal or figurative? Don't know. I'm thinking it's literal. I think there's literally going to be enough bloodshed that, that this pool of blood will fill this area. That, y'all, that's a lot of blood. We have five quarts of blood in a human body. I can't even imagine how much bloodshed is going to happen, but this is what the Bible's foretelling. You and I do not want to be any part of this or have any part of this. And Joel, there's no reason for us to have any part of this. There's absolutely no, unless I just want to be rebellious and disobedient, and maybe I just want to see for myself, but who in the right mind would want to do those things? We get to chapter 15. Chapter 15 is still dealing with the seventh trumpet, but it, the seventh trumpet is going to open up the seven vials or the seven bowl judgments. Verse 1, And I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues for them is filled up in the wrath of God. We'll get to those plagues next Sunday morning uh, in chapter 16, and they are very similar to the plagues that God put upon Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, why is that? Could John not be more, um, more charismatic in his writing to tell us a different story? Or is he mimicking what's going on in Exodus? I think it's that the Lord is an entity that does things the same way over and over and over. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to understand the Old Testament. Because if we don't understand the Old Testament, the New Testament just won't come to life for us. And if we don't understand the New Testament, the Old Testament is just kind of old and boring. You put the two together and understand that they're connected and understand how they're connected and why they're connected, this book comes to life. This book is something that you can't... It is a runaway bestseller. It is an incredible read. You won't be able to put it down once you start to get to that point where you're like, I see a connection here. I see that God's doing something. We'll get to more of that next Sunday morning. So we get to verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark. And we understand what that is now. We understand who the beast is. We understand his image. We understand uh, what the mark is, perhaps, or where it may be located, or at least some possible, possible and plausible explanations. And over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God... In verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses. And the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb. This is a new song. The song of Moses is where? Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. The Antichrist of the day, Pharaoh, was causing all kinds of problems with God's people. Had him incarcerated, had him in bondage, had him in judgment, would not let these people go. God sent these plagues to him to get his attention. And he let his people go. They got about halfway where they were going. Pharaoh changed his mind because that's what the devil does. He's a lie and a cheat and a thief. Pharaoh is symbolic of the devil in this book of Exodus and certainly throughout the Bible. God miraculously delivers them away from that bondage, away from that, that tyranny. And they get to the point when they're on the other side of the Red Sea, and in verse 15, uh, chapter 15, they sing what's known as the Song of Moses. And I'm going to read it to you. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord, the Song of Moses referred to, saying this, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. Now, he did this in Egypt back in the day. He's going to do this across the world in the coming years, I think. Certainly at some point he's going to do it. And these people that are saved, these people that understand his salvation, in spite of going through the most horrific, horrible set of circumstances they possibly could have, will sing this. It's going to come to them naturally, I think. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Y'all remember the four horses we talked about back in the earlier chapters? 
The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and His army He has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in this Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Do y'all see the connection here in Revelation? <laughs> Humor me and shake your head, yeah. yeah y'all, y'all see this connection? God is going to do on a global scale what He did on a regional scale back in the Old Testament. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. God's offer of salvation is never going to change. The culture may say, you don't have to do this, but if God says you got to do this, you got it, it's never going to change. Culture may say that, well, you have to do this. If God's word says you don't have to do this, it's never going to change. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. That's never going to change. It's never going to change. The people can say, well-meaning people can say, well, blood sure is kind of a gory thing. I mean, why does, why does your God have to deal with blood? Because the Bible also says that the life of the body is in its blood. It's blood. If he'd have used peanut butter, we'd have had people saying, well, why has God got to use peanut butter? We just need to stop being silly and just realize that this is what God has said. And he's going to say it 2,000 years ago, and it was applicable then. It was applicable in the 1300s. It was applicable in the 1700s. It was applicable in the 1900s. It's going to be applicable if God tarries another 1,000 years in the year 3024. It's never going to change. And God is giving us these examples to let us know that, well, wait a minute. He did this before on a regional scale. Why is he doing it on a global scale? Because he never changes his methods. And these people are singing about it. We keep going to verse 6. Become glorious in power. Who is the right hand of God the Father? Jesus. Jesus has become glorious in power. They're recognizing it, perhaps. He's always been glorious. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. He's going to do it. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. He's going to do it. You sent forth your wrath. He is going to do it. It consumed them like stubble. He is going to do it. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. Good luck with that. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw. Yeah, you keep saying all you want. Verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? There is nobody like him. There are no gods. There are fictitious gods. There's man-made gods. There are things that we want to worship as gods, but there's only one God, and he is worthy. Who is like you in glorious and holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, Jesus. The earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth, by the cross, by the way, in verse 12. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. This is exactly what he is saying he's going to do in these chapters that we're reading now. I find that to be absolutely incredible. I don't think there's a person alive that could go the amount of time it took to write this book and the number of different authors it took to write this book and they would all be perfectly aligned with one another unless God did it himself. It's impossible. And here we have in verse... Uh, chapter 15, verse 1 again, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. He did the same thing in Exodus. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, Pharaoh, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass. It was the Red Sea, now it's the Fire Sea, I suppose, having the harps of God. And they sang, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now we're having this new uh, song given to us, Miss Catherine, this new song that we can sing, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee? Does that ring a bell? Does that not sound familiar? O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. There are no other gods. Does that ring a bell? It does to me. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. 
This new song is the old song. And I want to share something with you as I've done my research that I thought would be kind of cool to mention to you, not about this song. And I want you to think about this. I want to compare these two songs. The song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb is sung at the Sea of Glass. The song of Moses was a song of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is a song of triumph over Babylon. The son of Moses told the song of Moses told how God brought his people out. The song of the Lamb tells how God brings his people in. The song of Moses was the first song in scripture and the song of the Lamb is the very last song in scripture. The song of Moses commemorated the execution of the foe, the expectation of the saints, and the exaltation of the Lord. The song of the Lamb does the same thing. The song of Moses was sung by redeemed people. The song of the Lamb was sung by redeemed people. Both songs look back to the blood of this Lamb that is standing at Jerusalem from the earlier chapters. Y'all, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? How can John write this to correspond with what Moses write, wrote to such a degree of perfection? He can't unless God's writing it through his pen, which he is, which he did. Verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Y'all don't need me to tell you what that means, do you? Y'all ought to know that. Y'all ought to be picking that out by now. Verse 7, And one of the four beasts, we know who that is now, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> yeah, thank you. We know who that is. Listen. And one of the four beasts, who are the four beasts? Does anybody remember? What's that? The gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels. I can't explain it. I don't understand why they're running around like beasts, in a good way, not bad beasts. But I do believe it's the gospel. I think the go guys, the gospel... The, the, the books of the Gospels are probably the most important books in the entire Bible. So important that they find themselves at the throne of God for all eternity. And one of them gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the reason why this is so important is that the Gospels are the, are the instruments that God has used to let us understand you can bypass the wrath. All you have to do, all we have to do, all we have to teach your children or grandchildren is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can supplement that with the other books of the Bible, and we should at the appropriate time, but the gospels of God are the most important books in the history of mankind, I think. And the teaching here, Miss Becky, is that the gospel, this is, the, this is the end of the opportunity for salvation. So the gospel is telling this angel, pour it out. Pour it out. Again, verse 7. We're going to close in two verses. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials. We know what the word seven means. We understand what's happening here. These things are full of the wrath, not of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, Miss Teresa, has already done his damage. He's still doing his damage when this happens. Now God's opening up a can, and it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. This wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever, in verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke. This isn't the first time God has used smoke to describe the temple when something was going on. If we know the Old Testament, this is going to jump out to us. We're going to know exactly what's going on here. From the glory of God and from His power, and no man, listen to this, Miss Becky, no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The beginning of this judgment is the beginning of the end. And at this point in time, Jeremy, there are no more saved. There is no opportunity for salvation. God is saying, enough's enough, I'm done. I'm going to open up my wrath. And the people are going to see it. And if you're not saved at this point in time, I don't know what to tell you. But the good news is, we don't have to go through it. Church, I can't stress it enough. When I first got baptized, I remember like it was yesterday how I responded afterwards. 
I went down, Dr. Lewis, and I wanted to be baptized. And he baptized me. That Monday, the next day, I'm at work, and there's no change in me. I didn't realize how important that was until months later. Eight months later, guys, I would go to work, and there was absolutely no change in me. A year later, David, there's no, I'm walking, I'm drinking beer, I'm using the Lord's name in vain, I'm cussing like a sailor, I'm reading stuff I shouldn't read, I'm doing all this, but I've been baptized. Ha! Lost as a, God, y'all, I'm going to bust hell. I don't believe it. Somebody might tell me, Miss Amanda, well, you're not saved because you show it on anger. Well, I'm saved, I've been baptized. Guys, don't be fooled into thinking you're okay unless you're okay. And you're not okay unless you're changing. If there's no change in your life, radical, dramatic change, something's bad wrong. Now, if this was 1950, I'd say, man, let's go back and knock off some fried chicken and go home. It's all good. Guys, we don't have 70 more years ahead of us anymore. We just don't. We don't. We've got to make absolutely sure that we're absolutely sure. How do I know that I know God? If you've been in Wednesday night for the last couple of, well, month maybe, you should know. How do I know that I believe in God or that I love God? Excuse me. You should know this week coming in three days. How do I know that I believe God? I'm going to go over that. Why? Just filler material until I'm out of here? No. I'm trying to prepare you guys to look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I really who I think and say that I am? And I'm one person on Sunday in front of the preacher, but I'm totally different in front of everybody. That is wrong. There's something wrong, y'all. Now, some of you may be sitting there going, well, Brother Bill, I've been baptized. I did it too. Yeah, I know exactly what you got. I did. I've been baptized. Dr. Lewis baptized me, y'all. I saw the bubbles coming up when I was underwater. I know I've been baptized. You can't tell me I'm lost. Miss Brenda, if I'd have perished any time during that period of time, I'd be in hell right now. Thinking that I've been baptized, that I'm good to go. It was until I started getting into the Word of God. I started listening to the Word of God on the radio because I was doing windshield time. I was doing 70, 80, 90,000 a year on windshield time in a company vehicle. And I got sick and tired of hearing all of the rock and country and everything. I'm just a genre of music. I'm done. I'm just sick and tired. Of it. Let me try religious music, Christian music. Well, praise God it wasn't on at that time, but the time I was driving, there was back-to-back -back preaching every 30 minutes. And y'all, I started listening to it, and I started to understand, and I started to see things better and clearer. And I pulled over on the side of the road in western North Carolina and said, God, I'm lost as a golf ball. Been going to church for years at that point in time. Been active in church at that point. I am as lost as I can possibly be because I had not changed one bit. I don't want you guys or anybody, anybody that might be listening to this tape, uh, to go through what's the, what the Lord's promising that's going to happen. I don't want anybody to do that. And if I can't get out of myself and over myself to allow Jesus to do something that needs to be done to me, I deserve to go through it. But I don't want y'all to do that. So I'm not judging anybody. I'm just simply saying, if, you're, if your life is not demonstrating radical, dramatic change, like Paul's life, like Stephen's life, like Peter's life, uh, like Matthew's life, like Mark's life, like Luke's life, like John's life, like a host of other... If you're just going through the motions, you're probably not going to get there. Is that wrong of me to say that? Am I being judgmental? No. I'm telling you, from past where I have been in my life, I see things differently. I'm telling you from a heart of love and compassion, if you're not, if you don't know that you know that you know, get to that point. And it can start by just coming to this altar. I know this altar's kind of crowded a little bit. I know there's not much room. And I know we have this, this, this thought in our minds that, well, I don't need to go to the altar. I can do it right where I'm at. And you can, but there's something really magical about getting out publicly in front of everybody, in front of God, and being faithful to God's call to get down to that altar and doing something about this. There's something really supernatural about it. 
don't miss the chance. It can start tonight. We don't have to be the same way we've always been. I don't have to use the excuse, well, that's just who I am. No, I'm not that way anymore. God's changing me. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for supernatural power. I pray, Father, for an anointing of your Holy Spirit on each and every one of us here tonight. I pray, Father, for those, Father, that might be listening on YouTube, that they would realize, wait a minute, man, I'm sitting here. I've never changed. I'm still the same me. There's something. There's a disconnect, God. There's no way that you can be the same you if the Holy Spirit now resides in you. It's impossible. How can that be? And I pray, Father, Father, that if we've been lulled into contentment because it just is the, what it is and we're too embarrassed to, to do anything about it, Father, that your, your son said if we're too embarrassed to stand before him, that he'll be too embarrassed to stand before God in your behalf. Father, don't let the devil, don't let the culture, don't let the world, don't let our carnality, don't let our flesh talk us into those excuses that we use day after day and week after week or why we don't need to do it or shouldn't do it. Father, we're being convicted by your holy word. We're being convicted by your spirit, Father, that we need a change. And change is not good or bad, Father. It's necessary or unnecessary, and it's necessary. So, Father, have your way with everybody tonight. But most importantly, Father, have your way with me. I pray, Father, for, for a double portion. I pray, Father, that you would increase my territory and enlarge my coast. I pray, Father, that you would use me in a way, uh, not just with my kids and grandkids, but uh, the ripple effect from them, God, might start something very incredible that, Father, I can look back and say, look what you did. Look, 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 Father, what you have accomplished through faith. I pray, Father, that our, our people here would have that same heart's desire, God, that we would say, not my kids. My kids are not going to be uh, pawns of the devil, tools of this world anymore. As a father, I'm going to take responsibility for my children every day, not just on Sunday bringing them to church. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to live it in front of them. I'm going to do my very best, Father, to represent Jesus to them and them to Jesus. And, Father, trust that you'll do what needs to be done. I pray, Father, for those moms that are here and dads won't do it. it the mantle falls on you then, that you would have that heart to do these things. Father, we don't have 50 more years. We don't have 50 more months, I don't think. And I do not want anyone to perish, especially our children and our grandchildren. So, Father, have your way with our hearts tonight. Let us do what needs to be done. In Jesus' name we pray.